Today's text is Genesis 3, 1 through 20, Genesis 4, 1 through 10, and Genesis 4, 25 through 26. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not, you will surely not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delightful to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go. And the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. You may find your seats. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you uh, for the privilege of hearing your word and knowing that those things that have happened so many, many years ago uh, have found rest in Jesus Christ. And we are gathered here this morning praising the name of our Savior, 
because of the mercy that he has extended to us, Lord, the plans that have been laid before the foundation of the world that we should be redeemed, uh, Lord, things that are beyond us, and we just thank you, O oh God, creator of heaven and earth, that you took time to redeem that which was broken and that which was full of sin. Thank you for things that are too wonderful for us. Thank you for the beauty that we can be just uh, look upon and be encouraged by uh, in your word and through your magnificent acts of kindness towards us, especially in salvation. Thank you for this gathering this morning, that we can praise your name together and rejoice in the things that you have done. And I want to thank you, Lord Jesus, especially for the women that are in this congregation, Father, who bear in them so much of the distinction and beauty that you have designed. Lord, thank you for uh, the light that it is to a world that is perishing and broken, uh, that there is relationship that is found with Jesus Christ and that all that is distinguished about the character that you have designed and created in us, Lord, is magnified through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so I would just ask for your favor upon every woman that's here this morning, whether they've been able to, uh, Lord, uh, display uh, that beautiful provision of life through giving birth, or they display it, Lord, through acts of kindness and service in society that women are so apt to be able to do. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would bless them. We, play, we pray, Father, that you would, through them, manifest the beauty of femininity in this culture, the beauty and the joy of what you've designed in them and can only be given, Lord, through you. And Lord, I pray that you would forgive our culture for playing God and twisting and turning these beautiful designs that you have made. And I just ask, Lord, for redemption to come upon our culture. I pray for a stay of your hand of judgment against a culture that is so bent upon destroying beautiful things. And I pray that you'd forgive us, Lord, for not displaying as we should the redemptive work of Christ in our lives in a way that would be re, uh, light and salt in this world. But Lord, we just ask now that you would give us wisdom from your word so that as we go out into the world, we might be able to reflect this even more so. But for our time together, Lord, I pray that it would be full of joy as we gather around your word. I pray that we would be satisfied by the provisions that you have made through Jesus Christ and in our callings as men and women. And Lord, that you would receive the glory from all that we do. I would ask as well, Lord, that you just give me clarity for the sake of those who are here, uh, that they might see the word of God and understand something of what you've given. Uh, Lord, I pray for every church in this city that is being faithful and seeking to honor you in this wonderful uh, day of remembrance of mothers. I pray that you would bless their services, Lord. I pray that they might be full of joy, that they would be blessed beyond measure with spiritual change in their, in their services, Lord, that they might be strengthened and encouraged, that our city might be affected by Christians that are truly pursuing and following Christ as we should. Lord, keep us from falling away, from turning away to the things that uh, distract from the beauty of who God is and keep our church Lord, in a place that is reaching for the things of the Lord and humble enough to recognize when we have fallen short. Lead us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy Mother's Day. Wonderful to worship with you on such a fabulous day to remember mothers and all that God has designed and intended with this particular calling and this particular role. And uh, just so happy that the Lord has uh, still instilled in our culture a sense of need to distinguish this office uh, that is presented all the way throughout the world <laughs> in every tribe and in every nation and every tongue. This little family unit that is mothers and fathers is present regardless of how much we decide to twist it and turn it. Uh, we have spent some time reading this morning really a section of scripture uh, that, I, that I'm going to try to hold until the end of my message, and I want to introduce that through uh, just a quick brief look at Genesis chapter 1 and 2 as well. Uh, really, I'm coming to the origin of where these things, motherhood and fatherhood and men and women and design and all those things come from, and that is through Genesis. But I, I'm also wrestling because there's so much beauty in what God has designed in these specific roles, that there is just, it's hard to kind of know how to get it all into one section. That's why we spent, 
you know, a, a considerable amount of time reading such a large text. So don't worry, I'll get you out here in, in a normal amount of time. Uh, we're not going to go verse by verse through 30 verses or whatever it was that we ended up reading this morning. But I wanted that to, to just kind of linger in your mind so that as we go through our content and I try to reach for a couple things that hopefully are helpful, uh, that you might see by God's grace the beauty of at least what's, what I've been able to see in the scriptures and hopefully be encouraged by that this morning. So I want to just kind of focus our message and organize it under these three points, a divine and distinguished dignity, a, design, a divine design, and a divine duty that brings delight. Now let's begin with a divine and distinguished dignity. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn to chapter 1 of Genesis. I want to spend some time just kind of looking at a few things here in Genesis, and I'm going to uh, try to do something new here with my app here. So I'm going to go over to a different, um, a different app at the same time and maybe have some more success with being able to work through the, the, the uh, notes as we go along. Uh, and if it doesn't work, please forgive me. We'll go back to the PowerPoint and just move on, okay? So that's my little, uh, thanks for putting up with my little new try here. Genesis chapter one. It's interesting as we go through this chapter, all the way throughout the chapter, we have this incredible repetition of God's goodness and creation, right? So you, you, you got God, he creates matter and space and time, all these things are there. The Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the waters. Uh, and then God begins to order creation and to distinguish the aspects of creation. And with every segment of creation, he says, it is good, it is good, it is good. And then the sixth day, we get to, as we see here in chapter 1, verse 26, we get to these two very specific verses. Uh, let, then God said, let us make man in our image. So this particular section here, we read all the way through, God speaking, communicating his power going out and, 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 and life coming to be. And then he kind of changes uh, in, in the way he communicates. He says, let us make man in our image. Uh, we're going to come back to that in a, in a moment here in, in another point. But just I want you to notice, uh, I want you to notice the plural here. We go from a singular God to a plural there, and, and it kind of toggles back and forth throughout the text in, in many different ways, and we'll try to bring that out in a moment. But here's the primary focus. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then he displays what kind of likeness or, or image that would, that, that's going to, or how it's going to display upon this earth. And there's going to be dominion over the fists of the, over the, of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all creeping things that creeps. Okay, so verse 26, and we just got to pause here for a moment. Man's created in God's image. Adam and Eve have to figure out, okay, what does that look like? Okay, I'm just going to look at what God's already done. Dominion and, 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 and having authority over the earth is basically ordering the things that are before us so that they flourish. That's the example that God gave from Genesis chapter one all the way through verse 26. God touches things and makes them better, okay? That's the dominion that is supposed to be displayed by men and women on this earth. But this particular section here, make man in our image after our likeness, is repeated again uh, in verse 27. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. And then there's a distinction. There's like a parsing in this creation. Male and female, he created them, which is terribly important to understand, first of all, that this particular distinction in creation, this humanity, this male and female component that is present in creation is told four times that, are, that they are created in God's image. Uh, in other words, it's not like anything else he's already created, angels or animals or any other creature or stars or anything like that, there's a distinction here that is very important for us to understand. There is no higher order of being by which to identify ourselves, which is amazing. The dignity that you and I, just by being created in God's image, bear. And it really should infuse everything that we understand about ourselves and and, and, uh, and our worth, we need to change our concept of self-worth to a sense of God-worth and have dignity for ourselves and respect for ourselves because of who God is and who we represent as image bearers in this world. And then specifically, that we should do so as God has designed it to be between the functions and responsibilities that are given by God to men and to women, male and female who created them. 
And we've also mentioned before in our conversations and other messages how important it is just to recognize that, that this design, this, this design of male and, and female in this world, to limit one or to elevate one over the other is to diminish the, the, the fragrance or the influence of God's image in this world as he wants it to be. And so it's no wonder that there is such an attack upon uh, gender roles and responsibilities in even identifying what a gender is or what someone's, uh, what someone's assumed gender might be. There, there is an attack on this because if we do this well, it says to the world, God is. And he is awesome and powerful and glorious and holy and a God who creates things that are good. And so understanding that this distinction between mankind and creation is underscored by this referencing, look at this, of divine counsel. Let us make man in our own image. This is, this is we kind of go through this particular section, the dignity that we are to bear and then the knowledge of what God is doing. We can learn something in Scripture when we pause and say, what is it saying about God and what does it say about man? And we can kind of study it that way. What is it saying about God here? Well, we have, obviously, as I've said uh, earlier, we have these, this toggling back and forth between God as, as a singular identity, being, and then these relationships, let us and the Spirit of God and, and, and uh, different things as this, and later on we'll see the Lord God, there's this new identification uh, with the covenant God. But then this understanding that God actually takes counsel within himself for this creation of mankind. This is just amazing. This brings more dignity to who we are. Because if you look at Genesis chapter 1 and see how God orders creation, this is the very first time that we read that God takes time to take counsel within himself in this design. He speaks, you know, things into creation, let there be, and it was so and then he blesses and flourishing, now he's saying as well something different in the text. He's considering, contemplating, planning what it's gonna look like and how this particular role and responsibility that we are given is going to be presented. This mankindness composed of male and female that reflects the God-likeness that we are to reflect. This is absolutely amazing. And it underscores the depth of responsibility that you and I have as human beings with these callings that God has given us, this sense of making sure that we steward these callings as men and women. Uh, God was thinking through this, if we can put it in human terms, uh, what the importance of it is and how we're to magnify God through this, and then to understand as well that if we're sharing in this likeness, there is not one that is higher than the other. There's not a, a role that's more distinguished in dignity and in beauty and responsibility than the other, which is absolutely wonderful, and there's a lot of good reasons for that, but I think the most important reason that we must live in that realm is this, that if if there is any distinction in our identity and our value and in the dignity that we bear as God image bearers, then Jesus Christ representing himself to us would be of no avail. The plan of salvation wouldn't have worked. You see, Jesus, when Jesus came, he came as a man to identify with men and women because of that connection point, that unity. One act of sacrifice for one massive provision of salvation for all those who bear the image of God. And in his mercy renews that image so that we bear the image of God now displayed in the image of Christ to glorify God forever uh, in his presence. That's the end goal of the gospel. So getting this piece wrong actually sets us up for failure with the one piece that brings us the most joy, which is Jesus and the salvation that he brings and the glory and the mercy that he brings to you and to me. So we're kind of working through this idea of divine and distinguished dignity. I'm trying to underscore, maybe scratch away at how important this is and how it's seen in the text. This image of God and this being fruitful and multiplying and the responsibility to display this. Now let me just fast forward under this point to a little bit more that we see. God leads Moses to give this synopsis in chapter one of creation and now in chapter two, because of the dignity and the identity and the importance of this particular calling, 
he focuses on, he kind of just takes this little bubble and says, okay, I'm going to expand this. This is what it looked like for mankind when, when God was actually creating Adam and Eve. And this is basically chapter two. It's not two different versions of creation like many people who wanna, don't believe the scriptures want to tell you. This is index chapter one, focus chapter two on man, okay? Uh, leading us obviously to why there are problems, which is chapter three. Let's just kind of take a quick look at chapter two. I'm gonna slide all the way up here. And I want to focus on, briefly, verse 4 through 7. We have these stages. And I want to focus on how God creates Adam for a moment, because there is a theme that reaches all the way through the scriptures to what Jesus Christ does for us as Christians. And it's actually pretty cool, I think, anyway, and I hope you will as well. In verse 4, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord made them in the heavens when no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not caused it to rain in the land and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Verse seven. Then the Lord God formed man from dust. This is, this is the only place in creation where we see God stooping to play with the dirt that he's made. Okay? This is like I'm taking time to make this little thing that's gonna reveal my glory and my dignity and that beauty. The Lord God uh, formed man from the dust of the ground. Again, just a, a quick highlight to the, to the side. There's a change in the, 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 the way that God is revealing himself in the text. God, chapter one, verse one, God's spirit, chapter one, verse two. We run all the way through to chapter two when he's creating man, Lord God, capital of Jehovah, Elohim. Uh, which is important, and I'll get to that in, actually, let's just talk about it right now. How does that sound? Why is there this distinction? The very beginning, as we're thinking about the divine and distinguished dignity of mankind. The only time that the Lord Jehovah comes into reference point in the in scriptures is when God is personally interacting with his creation of mankind especially in a covenant way. When you think about Moses, who's writing this particular book, and what he's doing at this time. He's traipsing through a wilderness with a bunch of people that can't stand the fact that he's the guy in charge. And when they get up in the morning, they look out and they see fire and cloud, right? A pillar of cloud by fire at night, and in the morning, a cloud that covered them, and they'd go out for breakfast, and it's gonna be their lunch, and there's gonna be their dinner, and they'd scrape up, a bunch of manna off the ground. Their entire life was being sustained by the presence of God and the provision of God. And that God was the same God that rescued them from Egypt and was leading through the, through the wilderness into the promised land. It was the same God that actually made promises to Abraham and gave him the ability to, to flourish under uh, God's design and God's perspectives. It was the same God uh, that created the world and was now creating a nation. And that God is the covenant God, the one who takes time to make promises with people that are broken so that he can restore the dignity that they have of God-likeness, this time through his very image of his son. So there's a personal quality to this, that we are created not only to be sustained by the creator, not only to be like the creator, but to enjoy and have a personal relationship with the creator. Now all this is very important as we kind of make our way to the concept of what motherhood really means because there is something beautiful that God has designed with women that displays something of the nature of God. So God, the creative covenant maker, what does he do? And this is the connection later on in the New Testament as well. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's a, that's a major New Testament theme for us in so many ways that we're gonna come back to at the very end of the message. So hold that thought in your mind. But you almost see it. You know, we do CPR when someone's struggling, you're breathing into their lungs, you're trying to get anything out that's, that's blocking or inhibiting that, those passageways, and that breath comes in and they finally breathe and... <gasps> I can breathe again. You have this sense of this 
this creature, this, this atom that God had created, and he breathes in, and <gasps> he's alive. It's really an amazing picture of God's power. And this God is the one that's leading them. This is the God who brings life. That's the point. Moses, to the people of Israel, I have a design. You follow my design. You follow my paths. It will bring life to you. And we start to tie in some of these concepts. I'm created as a man and maybe a father or as a woman and maybe a mother. And if I follow God's designs in these callings, I will, I will, bring, I will experience God's life and bring life to those around me as he wants me to display in this world. So God creates man. He breathes life into him. He takes time to form Adam out of this dust. And then I want you to see as we kind of work through this section, for the very first time, God wants to say something about his creation. So I'm going to kind of fast forward to verse 18. Adam is there in the garden by himself with God, and the Lord God said, again, he's speaking. So remember, he speaks the world and the creation, be fruitful, multiply. And then takes counsel within himself, I'm speaking within myself, let's make man. There's no sin yet. And now God speaks again. And this time he says about his creation, it's not good that man should be, what's this word right here? Alone. What's the answer to man's loneliness? I will make a helper, that's important, fit for him. So it's one who will fit, uh, and uh, for, obviously we know this is evil, let me just make a quick point about the concept of helper because it, mentioned, it, it gives us an understanding of something about the person and the nature of God. When Jesus comes on the scene thousands of years later, the, the disciples are really worried about Jesus leaving. And Jesus says to them, don't worry, I will send the helper who is the Holy Ghost and he will lead you into all truth. He will encourage you and guide you and seal you, right? This is Paul, I mean, he's, got, he's a guarantee until the day of redemption. And it really helps us understand something about the relationship that Eve now is gonna play in Adam's life. It's not just that he's, she's gonna bring society to him, a helper, he's alone. That's the thing that needs to be fixed. God created Adam perfectly and complete and creates this woman to satisfy that, this need for the society and bring beauty and life and thriving and flourishing in this world through more image bearers that are being nurtured in the health and the admission of the Lord. And then she is called the helper as a consequence of that. She is reflecting not only the image of God and the fact that she bears his dignity, but reflecting the image of God's spirit and being the kind of person that comes alongside and encourages and guides and nurtures and causes to thrive. It's really fascinating because basically what we then get with Eve that displays in motherhood and in all aspects of your womanhood if you leave it in the hands of God is this beautiful component of life-giving spirit to the world around you, of joy, of happiness, of encouragement. I mean, you just think about your homes when, you know, maybe you're growing up and mom was joyful. Man, things are happening. She just gets excited and cookies are being made or whatever it is or bread or your favorite meal. And, and then what happens when, you know, dad's been a little cranky and mom's sad? Like the whole home just, Right? And we, I mean, we get the saying from this, if mama ain't happy, y'all know it, and if daddy ain't happy, ain't nobody cares, right? <laughs> Normal life. Women just have this ability to bring joy and thriving and beauty and, oh, I'm home. And you think about how even, like, kids and parents approach. There's, there's a calendar at home. There's a stewardship that's happening there. Even if everybody's busy, the questions don't come to dad, hey, when's my dentist appointment, right? I don't know. I go to the dentist and they ask me for my kid's birthdays and I'm like, okay, hang on. You gotta remember, remember when Gabriel was born and then go backwards or Anna and then go up, right? Like you just kinda, you gotta go and I gotta think about places where I was. Marjorie's like, boom, that stuff's right there. Women are created to be the center point of society the life givers. If you think of mothers and how they just are, all of that, their ability to touch all these different things, that's the dignity, the divine dignity that God has brought, a helper fit for him. Life givers, 
encouragers, strengtheners, blessers to those who are around them. Now, let me just reference something as well about this helper fit for him. So there was a design specifically that God was creating in Adam and Eve for this specific relationship. And the word helper, you have to understand, is also not just a reference or a display of what the Holy Spirit would be. It's not diminutive like in our society, right? This is beautiful. The word helper in the Old Testament has the idea of rescuing from an army that is going to destroy. It's my ally. I'm going to go help them and rescue them. And that's exactly what's happening with Adam. He is being rescued by Eve from his lack of society and his need for interaction. And so as we see in this particular section, as we go further down, the Lord God causes a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up the place of the flesh. Uh, Now this is right after God takes time to show Adam he is absolutely alone. And it's important because he wants to distinguish Eve from all of the creation to Adam. It's important as well because in this particular sense, God doesn't use a bunch of clay. God takes time to work with what he has already designed and is already amazing. And he makes something even more distinguished. He takes Adam's rib, which is, you know, protects the vital organs. It's not like a piece of DNA from a hair or a toenail or something like that. It's a rib. It's something that's going to be protective and life-giving in a sense, right? And then he closes up the place, and this is what's important. And he brought her to the man. She was a gift. There we go. She was a gift of God to Adam. That's so important, my friends, to think about what women are especially wives when they're given to a husband where they have that relationship, something that must be distinguished. She's a gift, a gift from God who created the world. The value in that, and I can't think of anything more amazing than to think about how Jesus Christ speaks about this in John when he talks about his people being gifts given to him by God. And what Jesus Christ then does to preserve and to protect and to bless that gift, he gives his life a ransom for his bride. This is the picture that ultimately is manifest in glory with Jesus. And it's a beckoning to us to live within the confines of his created design and order because they are healthy and they are good and they are bring light and they bring and they are life giving, but they also point to something so much greater of what God is doing. And then you see Adam. It's like this is at last bone of my bones. It's like I've been I've been looking for you. This is at last bone of my bones. That union, that quality, that beauty that's designed in women. So let me just say, ladies, that you are a gift. You are God's gift. Please hear this. You are God's gift to mankind. You have the distinction of being the most prized creation. This is the last work of God in creation, was Eve. The Sabbath day, that day was coming. He just declares it to be the day of rest. This is the last work of creation where God spends time. And we don't see anything more like this until we get to Jesus and he makes this promise of a new creation through his provision of salvation. You are valued. You have worth. You are unique in creation, not more than man and not less than man. You are an image bearer of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of the universe. And we want you to thrive. From a divine distinguished dignity PowerPoint went away. I'll just tell you what the next point is. To a divine design. A divine design. And here I want to underscore that the text highlights the gift of society, as we've mentioned. And we've talked about how important women are to all the, um, you know, the beauty and the thriving in a home. And if we look then and kind of connect these ideas to what Adam actually says in verse 30. Uh, It's incredibly helpful. Genesis chapter 3, verse 30. Do I have it in here? 
Nope. I'll have to tell you that too. I'm sorry. There is no 30. That's in Dave's manuscript 101. 20. Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. That's what I was looking for. The man called his wife's name Eve. The man called his wife's name Life. That's the idea. Because she was the mother of all living. She is the life giver to all. Now certainly this can stretch to mean natural care, uh, but more importantly, natural care of all things, of creation and all those kinds of things. But more importantly, and especially in a narrative that's about to introduce the, the presence of Cain, the firstborn son, this is talking about primarily about being a mother. And if I can just make a note about this, because I know it's very difficult for some women who are given all the physiology and desire and hope to be able to be women, mothers, and they cannot. The hardwiring is there, but God has not opened up an opportunity for you to display that part of your life. Let me just underscore that she is called a life giver before Cain was born. You are a woman, and you are not broken even if you cannot fulfill that calling in your life. You still display those same characteristics and qualities that God wants you to display. You must display them in different ways, obviously, and to be able to just nurture one of your own children. But that doesn't mean you are no less of a woman and no less dignified and no less beautiful and no less capable because of the hard wiring in you. We're in a broken world, and this sometimes just does not come together as we hope it would. But all of the things that are true to motherhood you have in you and that can and should and must be displayed in our society. Well, my goal under this point, I think it's especially important in our society, given the degradation uh, of this part of a woman's life, is that women are given the ability and desire and design and therefore mandate to bring God image bearers into this world. Be fruitful and multiply, says the Lord. Genesis 1, 28. And this is no more strongly said than in Malachi chapter 2. This is what God's word says in Malachi chapter 2. This is really fascinating because he's charging the people of Israel with not understanding their calling in their marriage relationships and for being unfaithful in those marriage relationships. This is what he says, verse 14 through 16. Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant, did he not make them one with the portion of the Spirit in their union? Pause. What was the Spirit of God doing in creation? Hovering, keeping care, energizing, his presence is there. And then we see as well this, this concept of, of, of Eve being the helper, a kind of pushing towards the Spirit's work in her own life in a distinct way, how she can display it in this world. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in, the, in your spirit and do not be faithless. Children are a gift from God, my friends. And if God has placed us in a marriage relationship, he wants us to obey this command because he wants displayed through that family relationship children that know the Lord. Godly offspring. I mean, just think about how many people come to know the Lord because their, their parents displayed that light in this world. I'm willing to bet half this congregation, or many more, came to know the Lord through the presence of their parents, sharing the gospel with them, raised in Christian homes, and now they are bearing the marks of God and Christ in this world. Well, let me just show you from this concept a little bit <clears throat> of the depth of where Scripture reaches in this teaching of godly offspring. I think this is where it gets kind of neat for me. You go back to Genesis chapter 3, we've got a sin problem. Genesis chapter 15, God says, I'm going to bring a seed through the woman that's going to crush Satan's head, though his heel would be bruised. And then when Cain is born, 
Genesis chapter 4, 4. Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man. It's like maybe the promise will be fulfilled, which is fascinating. I mean, just think about Adam and Eve for a second with the fall. They knew what perfection was like. And then they fell. They knew what it was like to be in beauty and glory and have everything work like it should in this world and then it not work. I mean, the closest that we can come to this is leave here and go to a third world country where you have trouble finding water and the taxi cabs are ripping you off and that's as close as we get. And when you get home, what do you want to do? Oh, I love America. Give me a hamburger and I need fries, right? Take all the cabs you want. They knew what it was like to go from perfection. All we know is to go from hardship to more hardship. I've gotten a man. God's redemptive works are going to be done. With what? The helper is helped by Jehovah. And then she bears another son, Abel, and it's like, wow, this is amazing. God is doing some incredible work. And I I want you to obviously see what we have here in this text where Cain is being religious in his worship of the Lord. Abel is being faithful. And then Cain becomes angry. God challenges him and encourages him to be faithful. He will not. Cain premeditates murder and kills Abel, his brother. Imagine what her parents, what his parents would have felt like at that moment. The hopes are gone of joy and renewal and restoration. My punishment is greater than I can bear, says Cain, because God is bringing judgment to him. But then we get all the way to the end after life is getting from bad to worse. And I want you to see this. Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth, for she said, God has appointed for me another offspring. She's looking for the satisfaction of the promise of God. Another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh, and at that time the people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Godly offspring. It's what Malachi is presenting. It's what Eve was reaching for and looking forward to, godly offspring. Now I want you to see where this is satisfied. Luke chapter three, if you can fast forward in your scriptures to Luke chapter three. We get to the lineage of Jesus Christ and I want you to go all the way to the very end We start with Jesus, verse 23, and it goes all the way to the very end. Verse 38, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Jesus Christ, finally here, fulfilled the promises of Genesis chapter 3, 15. Adam and Eve can finally rest in the beauty of what God has done. You and I have hope and joy and beauty because of God's redemptive work through the line of Seth, ultimately fulfilling Jesus Christ and realized in Christians being transformed, people, I should say, being transformed and made into divine beings by God's grace. A divine design, but then a divine duty very quickly And this is where we can tie in some of these things together, of God's breath and our calling and our responsibilities, especially here on Mother's Day. We've seen the connection point with Jesus Christ. What was one of the last things that Jesus Christ did with his disciples before he left? He breathed on them the Holy Spirit. Genesis chapter two, with Adam, God's breath brings life. Genesis, or then we get all the way to John, chapter 20, Jesus' breath brings life. We find out from Paul later on in 2 Timothy 3.16 that the word of God that we bear here in our hands brings forth life. It is breathed out by God. And what is this word? God, Jesus Christ, in one of his kingdom parables, parables, compares it to seed that is sown out that bears fruit. And that concept ties in right away with 
the, the, sh- the sowing of the seed to bring forth life, that generation of seed, that, that conception of a new life in Christ, that you and I have the power to focus our responsibilities primarily on the need to bring godly offspring through the proclamation of the word of God, which is God breathing on people when they hear God's word. And those who are God's gifts, all that are given to me by the Father will come to me. Now, you and I as Christians are not stuck just producing children that may or may not know the Lord. That's dignified because they are image bearers. But we have the privilege and the authority and the responsibility to now infuse the gospel of Jesus Christ into that relationship and into everything that we do so that even if we're not parents, not mothers, not fathers, we can display that life-giving spirit by sharing Jesus Christ. And what's the consequence of this? Why is there a divine duty that brings delight? Because at the end of our life, when God calls us home, Jude 24 reminds us that we are presented blameless before the presence of God with great joy. So let's start back with Genesis chapter two. God creates Adam. He forms a woman and brings her to him. Sin devastates the world. God sends his son and gives his son broken people. And then one day when we stand in the presence of God, Christ takes the redeemed and presents them before God as gifts back to him. That's amazing. And that's the privilege that you and I have on a day like this, to contemplate the work of God in salvation, to be nurturers and builders up and points of reference to everyone who would but listen to that breath of God through the word of God. And mothers, you can do this in a way that is so distinct and distinguished from even what men can do because you're hardwired in a different way for this kind of life. Oh, may God give you the strength and the wisdom and may he help us all to be fearlessly, wonderfully committed to this call. The Lord bless you. Happy Mother's Day. Amen. Father, thank you for your grace. I pray that you would be glorified in all that we have said and done today. And I pray again a blessing upon all the women that are here. Cause your face to shine upon them for good in Jesus' name. Amen.